Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Comedy and satire this hour with the very funny Stan Freeberg. This episode of the program, which parodies uh, psychology and psychiatry, entitled The Lone Analysis, no, The Lone Analyst, is originally broadcast August 25th, 1957. the outcome of the Floyd Patterson Radnagger fight. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you what this is. This is the seventh show of the series of a brand new radio series. From Hollywood, we present the Stan Freeberg Show. With the music of Billy Mann. Plus the songs of Peggy Taylor with Doris Butler, June Foray, Peter Leach, and the Judge Conlon Rhythm Airs. You may not find us on your TV Because in case you did not know We're being brought to you on Brought to you on Brought to you on our API Hello what is this bit of paper on the floor? Why, why, it's a newspaper clipping. Oh, will you read it, Stan, so we can, you know, get into the sketch. All right, Dawes. It says here, Dr. Hugo Gunk of Cornell <laughs> stated today at a press conference, and I quote, if the government would spend as much money training psychiatrists as it does training law enforcement officers, crime would be eliminated in 50 years. <laughs> no, no, I find that pretty hard to believe. 52 years, maybe. Yeah, well, uh, as it, as it, anyhow, this gives one pause to wonder uh, what it would do to the fearless six-gun-toting heroes of the radio serials. Would the U.S. Marshal become the U.S. Analyst and trade in his gun for a couch? End of quotation. Gosh, Dawes, you think they could ever make the Lone Ranger a psychiatrist? No, nah, nah, it never, never would. Work. Clinic into the west with the speed of light and a cloud of dust and the psychoanalyst manual in his hand. The lone analyst rides again. <laughs> Near the little town of New Rosies, New Mexico, a masked man and an Indian press forward into the gathering twilight. Hurry, Pronto. Press forward into the gathering twilight. Mm. <laughs> Got to get to Grandpa Snyder's if I'm going to straighten him out before he cracks up. Emos Lobby. <laughs> Faster, Pronto. Faster. Get him up, Scooter. <laughs> Gee, if it wasn't that we needed a switch on Get Him Up Scout, you could have a horse instead of a scooter. Hmm. Constant hopping play Havoc with Soul of Moccasin. Whoop. Whoops. A word of caution, Pronto. You have a choice of three things to say. Hmm. Get him up, Scooter. And Chemo Slobby, you have no other lines. <laughs> Hmm, how come you get all good lines? Look, you want to be the big man? Sit up here in the white horse and wear the mask, is that it? Okay, but what I do with Scooter? Forget it, will you forget it? Look, there's a stranger up ahead. I'll ask for directions. Whoa, big fellow. Whoa, big fellow. Whoa, big fellow. Big fellow. (laughs) Only as a big fellow. Howdy, stranger. Howdy, do. How comes it you're wearing a mask? Going to a party? No, the... Because I dearly love parties. <laughs> no, the, uh, the reason I wear it is so no one will know me. At the party, you mean? No, there is no party. 
Can you direct me to Grandpa Snyder? Grandpa Snyder? That's the party. I thought you said there weren't no party. <laughs> there isn't. Grandpa Snyder's. Which way? Well, it's about two hoots and a holler down the road. I hope everybody gets paper hats and favors. <laughs> Oh, Luke. Oh, I don't mind if I do. Hey, Luke, how come they're serving drinks to that kid down to the end of the bar? That ain't no young kid. That's old man Grisby. He's 104 years old. 104 year old? Mm -hmm. Why, he's got a face like Bobby Breen. <laughs> how, how, how can he do it? Well, let's mosey up behind him quiet like. He's getting ready to order now. Give me another shot of that Adolph's meat tenderizer. Whoa, big fella. Whoa, whoa. <sighs> Greetings, gentlemen. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the lone analyst. Howdy, analyst. Have straight jacket. We'll travel. <laughs> going to the, uh, going to the party, eh? No, there is no party. That's a mighty strange-looking saddle you got on your horse, analyst. Yes, it's the only saddle in these parts that opens up into a couch. <laughs> Gee, Analyst, that's quite a rig. If you think this one's something, you should have seen the saddle a friend of mine had. He loved picnics, and his opened up into a redwood table and two benches. <laughs> it sounds like a real crazy saddle. Sure does. Sure was. Mmm, got him up, Scooter. Chemo Slobby. What did you say that for, Redskin? Mmm, no reason. Just making small talk. <laughs> Can you direct me to Grandpa Snyder's? Well, yeah, it's about two miles... <laughs> hey, say, how come that big white horse cackles instead of whinnying? He has a complex. <laughs> he thinks he's a chicken. Well, you're the lone analyst. Why don't you straighten him out? I would, but I need the eggs. <laughs> Ronald, uh. through analysis, perhaps we may help. Hold it. Too piercing. <laughs> I say through analysis... Perhaps we can help Grandpa Snyder find the real him. Uh, Did you say something? No. Indigestion. Uh, Pronto, look. Up ahead. There's a shortcut. Come on, big fellow. Get him up, Scooter. <laughs> Darn it. Some wise guy painted a shortcut on those rocks. <laughs> Look off yonder, Grandpa. It's a masked man on a bent horse and an Indian on a bent scooter. <laughs> bent, huh? <laughs> Grandpa, have you been painting shortcuts on the rocks again? Yeah, I'm just a frustrated old man. Oh, big fellow. Howdy, folks. You must be Mrs. Snyder. Speaking. And this is Grandpa. Yes, he's the one I've come to see. Uh, what for? To straighten me out? Partly. I thought you said there weren't no partly. <laughs> there weren't. I mean, the oh, boy. <laughs> Steady, Leghorn. Steady. Leghorn? That's a funny name for a horse. Yes, well, he has a mental block. He, he thinks he's a chicken. Oh, well, that's nothing. We got a chicken over there who thinks he's a horse. Yes, well, I'm the lone analyst. I reckon as though it's my duty to straighten him out. Well, I appreciate your offer, analyst, but uh, we like the chicken to think he's a horse. Why? Because he's won the Kentucky Derby three years running, that's why. Oh, I see him now. The chicken wearing the little saddle and reading his press clippings. 
That's him. <laughs> Hold it. Where could he get a jockey small enough to ride him? Oh, well, he knows a gopher who thinks he's Willie Shoemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept that. Now, analyst about Grandpa, he thinks he's a great Dane, and I can't tell him no different. I see. How long have you been obsessed with this idea? Ever since I was a pup. <laughs> well, well just, just lie down here on the couch, will you? Oh, no, she don't like me to get up on the couch. I'm supposed to stay in my basket. That's, that's nonsense. You're no more a dog than I am. Here, have a bone. <laughs> Thanks, I'll bury it later. Now, repeat after me. I am not a Great Dane. I am not a Great Dane. I am Grandpa Snyder. I am Grandpa Snyder. And once again, I am not a Great Dane. I am Grandpa Snyder. I am not a Great Dane. I am Grandpa Snyder. Hey, hey Ma, I'm well. I'm well. Oh, my toys! Oh, shuckins. He's gone, and I wanted to thank him. Who was that masked man, anyhow? Beats me, but I'm well. You are? Sure. Feel my nose. <laughs> much for analysis. <laughs> and now for another stirring moment, a very special guest. On our first show from the Basque region of France, you'll recall we presented Monsieur Marcel Toulet and his chorus of tuned sheep. Uh, at that time, uh, Monsieur Toulet told us that his brother Francois played the nose flute. Uh, Mr. Francois Toulet is here with us tonight. Again, due to a language barrier, I've asked our good friend Monsieur Devaroux, who's familiar with the Basque dialect, to interpret for us. It is a <laughs> great pleasure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the nose flute is a bamboo tube. There's one hole into which the air is blown and two to let it out. Now, perhaps he will fill us in on how he plays it. I ask him. L'on s'est pas rassé, le temps, on s'est pas rassé, on technique, puis l'on s'est vu avec nos flûtes, plein de fois. Il est rassé, mais t'as rassé. Il sait, il plays it with his nose. <laughs> Fine. Well, let's get a little history of the instrument. So, this is from the Basque region of France, eh? Long si vous avez le basque région de France, pourquoi c'est votre point? Et que je me dérange, et le fond, et que je te mets à deux, et. He says he thinks you are off your rocker. He got it in Hawaii. Ah, uh, qu'est-ce qu'il y a? Il y a qu'est-ce qu'il y a qu'il y a? What did he say? What did he say? I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's, a, that's Hawaiian. He has switched languages. Oh, fine. <laughs> Monsieur Freeberg, we are undone. I cannot understand him. Billy, Billy May, you've done uh, quite a lot of time in the islands. Uh, <laughs> do, uh, do you know the language? Sure, Daddy-o. Tahuya muya. Puya kuya kuya, man. Ahuya kula ua. Tahihihi alua tutu amui poipu. Well, what did uh, Monsieur Toulet say? He says, like, man, the whole thing is bugging him, and if you'll knock off the quacking which he digs the least, he will get on with the nose flute turkey. <laughs> Monsieur Toulet? Monsieur Billy May. Oh. <laughs> Never mind. What's he going to play, Billy? Music from the islands? I'll ask him. Ilue muya bula honolula scuba doo. Honolulu scuba doo. Yaka hula Dixie ula. He says like he only makes Dixie. Well, a bass playing Dixie land on the Hawaiian nose flute should be a novelty. Hit it, boys. <laughs> Catastrophe! Is his nose caught in the flute? 
<laughs> Just one of the hazards of the sport, and thanks for being with us. <laughs> I wonder if the Blue Cross covers something like that. August 25th, 1957, the Stan Freeberg Show on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Veterinary telemedicine is booming. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Teller, president of the American Veterinary Medical Association, and I know firsthand that telehealth is a valuable tool to help provide our precious pets with the health care they need and deserve. Here are some situations where telemedicine may be an option for you and your pet if the veterinarian has seen your pet in person in the past, if you're not sure you need to schedule an in-person visit, if your pet had surgery and needs post-operative follow-up, for skin diseases and rash rechecks, when your veterinarian needs to monitor your pet's chronic problems such as diabetes or allergies, if there are behavioral issues or training challenges, or for hospice care. It's always good to have your session in a quiet place with good lighting. If you're not sure if you should set up a telehealth session, call your veterinarian and they'll let you know. To learn more, check out avma.org slash telehealth. avma.org slash telehealth. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox Moore, the Stan Perryberg Show, August 25th, 1957. Next May will mark the 89th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike that completed the first transcontinental railroad in the United States. Uh, It's a bit early to celebrate this event, but, uh, you know, better early than never. So our alert news staff brings you now a reenactment of the driving of the Golden Spike (laughs) on the program that takes you back to historical moments. There you are. This is Hal Wibley of There You Are. We're at Promontory Point, Utah, where the rails of the first transcontinental railroad will soon meet and be joined by a golden spike. They are now only one mile apart, and they are working like mad. While we are waiting for this historic meeting, we switch you to Chuck Grisby of There You Are. Thank you. This is Chuck Grimsby. I am stationed near the point where the rails will meet at the Iron Horse Bar and Grill. Beside me is Mr. Patrick Hammerhead Grogan. The man who's been chosen to drive the Golden Spike. Mr. Grogan, will you tell us how you came to have the honor to be chosen as the man to drive the Golden Spike? Well, uh, you see, I was working on the track yesterday. Yes? And the fireman, he comes up to me and he says, Hey, Grogan, you doing anything tomorrow? (laughs) And I says, uh, no. So he says, the foreman says, Okay, you'll drive the golden spike. A remarkable story, Mr. Grogan. Now we switch you back to Hal Webley for a report on the progress of the track laying crew at Promontory Point. This is Hal Webley at Promontory Point. The crews are now three quarters of a mile apart and coming on fast. We switch you now to There You Are correspondent Rip Midgley. This is Rip Midgley at Ogden, Utah. I'm in the cab of the engine that will proceed from here to meet the train from the west at Promontory Point, where the Golden Spike is driven. The fireman and engineer are getting ready to start the engine, so let's listen. I beg your pardon, Mr. Engineer. Some coal? Yes, please, Mr. Fireman. Two lumps. (laughs) Cream? No, thanks. I'll take it black. (laughs) Very well, sir. We return you now to Howe Webley at Promontory Point. This is Hal Webley at Promontory Point. The track laying crews are now a half a mile apart and coming on fast. We switch you now to, there you are, correspondent, Speed Langley. Yes, this is Speed Langley. I'm in a single tower at Steve Canyon, Nevada. Beside me is the single man who will clear the track for the eastbound train, which will meet the westbound train at Promontory Point. Sir, will you describe the procedure you will follow to clear the track for the eastbound train? Well, sir, when I hear coming down the line, I'll stick my head out the window, point my finger east, and holler... Okay, Charlie, just follow them tracks. <laughs> Are you pleased about being assigned to this important job, sir? I sure am. <laughs> I waited in this gold dang tower 
nigh on to five years before there was any track going by at all. <laughs> and now we return it to Hal Webley. This is Hal Webley. The track layers are coming into the home stretch. The east is ahead by half a length, and they're coming on fast. They're approaching the finish line. The west is gaining. The west is at the finish line. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The track layers from the east have stopped. They're still two feet short of the finish line. I'm, I'm trying to get close to the track layers to find out why the east stopped so suddenly. Here's the foreman coming this way. Oh, sir, sir, would you mind telling me why the track layers from the east have stopped? We're short by two foot. <laughs> well, what can you do? We could go back to Chicago and push a little. <laughs> That would be quite time-consuming. Or, or I could slap in a two-foot piece. And your decision is? Slap in a two-foot piece, you fathead. Thank you, sir. Here, folks, is an Indian chief approaching. Oh, chief, will you tell our listeners what you think of the iron horse? Hmm, iron horse, bad medicine. Well, what do you consider good medicine? Buffering. <laughs> And the conclusion of the Stan Freeberg Show from August 25th, 1957. Following these important words, you're listening to Classic Radio Theater. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care. Especially now, with inflation the way it is, people are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and Find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE, 833-34-BIBLE. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of the Stan Freeberg Show, August 25th, 1957, the Golden Spike. Thank you, Chief. Oh, pardon me. I see they've gotten their track and they're ready to drive the Golden Spike. Yes, folks, this is the big moment we've been waiting for. Mr. Grogan is stepping into position. He is grasping the Golden Spike in his left hand. He is raising the hammer with his right hand. Now he is about to drive that Golden Spike... There it goes. Down comes the hammer and... Oh, Oh, he hit his thumb on the first try. (laughs) Now he's trying again. There he goes. He did it! He did it! The golden spike is driven. And now here comes the trains. One from the east and one from the west. They're speeding to the meeting point. The historical spot at the promontory point where the east and west will meet. They're getting closer. They're about to meet. They met. I'd like to get President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, and get his reaction. Oh, Mr. President, would you say a few words about the meeting of the trains? <clears throat> it would appear to me they should have laid two tracks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Not to shout like that. 
Well, I... Uh... It's like right in my ear, man. Well, it goes with the song, you yeah, know. Yeah, but don't holly my ear, man. Well, it's authentic calypso. Yeah, but like, why stand next to me, Shout. man? Oh, well, the shouts go with the bongo drums. Well, not my bongo drums, man. I mean, move away like. Well, I don't see why you can't... Uh... No, no, no. Stand over next to the guitar, man. He sent me over here. <laughs> yeah. Well, then sing soft, man. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Okay. Stay! Too loud, man. Stay! That's better. Is it day, 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 oh, oh. Daylight come and me wang up oh. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, we're call night and a drink of rum. Daylight come and me wang go home. Stack banana till the morning come. Daylight come and me wang go home. Left six oh, foot, hold it, man. Hold it, man. Hold it. Eight foot bunch. Daylight it's too come loud, and man. It's too loud. Go home. Six foot, seven no, foot. No, hold it, man. Hold it, hold it. Bunch. Daylight oh, my ears. My ears. Like my ears. No, hold it, man. No, it's too shrill, man. It's too pissed. Oh. <laughs> No, it's too piercy, man. Well, it's too piercy. Well, I got through the shout. No, man, it's too piercing. Like, I don't dig loud noises. Well, you ruined the whole piercing. Record is what you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, tough, I'll take my bongos and go, man, because the whole thing is, like, bugging me anyhow. Yeah, well, wait, 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 wait. Well, no, 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 I'm, I'm, shout. I, I'm cutting, man, like I didn't want to make this gig in the first place. No, wait, wait a minute. I'd, I'd be soft. Yeah. I'd be soft. Yeah, well, back, back off from me, man. It's too piercing. Okay. How's this? Too loud, man. <laughs> Too loud, man. I can still hear you. Would you mind leaving the room? Okay. Crazy. <laughs> Daylight come and me won't go home. Daylight come and me won't go home. Hey, beautiful bunch of ripe bananas. Daylight come and me won't go home. Hide the deadly black tarantula. Daylight come and me won't go home. Don't, don't, don't sing home. about spiders. I mean, ooh, like I don't dig spiders. He <laughs> <laughs> goes, hide the deadly black tarantula. Ooh. Daylight come and me won't go home. Is that it? Can I leave now? No, not yet. We've got a big finish. Hey. Yeah, man. I locked myself out. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> I come through the window. Daylight come and we won't go home. Wow. Thank you. My thanks to Peter Lees for interrupting me in the banana boat song. So, till next week then, uh, let's see, next week we'll bring you the lone psychiatrist, uh, Monsieur Toulet and his nose flute. Uh, the Banana Boat song. Uh, no, that's what we did tonight. That's right. I don't know what we're going to do next week. Oh, yeah, we're going to do St. George and the Dragonette and many other things, too. So until next week, this is Stan Freeberg saying thanks for listening, God bless you, and good night. The Freeberg Show is produced in Hollywood by Pete Barnum and is written by Stan Freeberg, Pete Barnum, Charles Butler, and Jack Roach. Featuring the music of Billy May, Judd Conlon for the Mayors, and the songs of Peggy Taylor with Charles Butler, Peter Leeds, and June Foray. Bud Sewell speaking. August 25th, 1957, The Stan Freeberg Show on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox.
Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we head to Pine Ridge, Arkansas to see what's going on at the Jot 'em Down store of Lum and Abner, August 25th, 1948. <laughs> Now let's see what's going on down in Pine Ridge. Well, as we look in on the little community today, we find the reckoning date of the Donnelly Will drawing closer. Abner still has a few possessions left. And in the meantime, Lum is the one who's getting into debt. As we look in on the little community today, we find Abner in the Jotham Down store. Lum is just entering. Listen. Come in. Oh, it's just too long. Yeah, Granny, is that Cedric sure getting to be a hard man to deal with? He is, huh? I guess that little duty Bates has been pumping him full of ideas. Well, did you ever get him to sell you that property? Yeah, I finally got it for $6. For $6? Yeah, for a while today, he wanted $90,000. 90000 Yeah, I don't know where he ever got a figure like that. Well, know me, how'd you ever get it from him, from cleaning down to $6 from 90000 Well, it was his own suggest order. He finally said he'd take 90000 or $6 and all the peanut butter he could eat. <laughs> Lonely, chunk style. Chunk style. That boy. So natural, I'd taken him up on that offer. Oh, sure. I figured he could take the peanut butter out of your half of the store as long as you want to get shut of everything anyway. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh, how'd you make out with Squire Skimp then? Did he take the property in on your note? Oh, yeah, he was easier to deal with than Cedric. He was, huh? Yeah, I think there's some kind of development going on around that land, so he was sort of anxious to get that property back. <laughs> he wouldn't actually let on, though. Well, I'm sure glad he taken it. Well, now you got your note paid off, and I'm shut of that property. All I got to get rid of now is my half-interest of store here, and I'm broke. Yeah, you're doing way yonder better than I ever thought you would. <laughs> here a few weeks ago, you owned a home and a lot of land. And... Hey, wait a minute. You still got that oil stock. Huh? Don't you recollect you sank $1,500 in that oil company Squire got up here a while back? Oh, yeah, but that stock ain't no good long. No, it ain't, but then again, it might be, you know. And if them lawyers in St. Louis finds out you've got $1,500 worth of any kind of stock, they're going to think you're holding out on them. That you ain't actual broke after all. Yeah, but you know as well as I do, Lum, any stock Squire Skimp sells, you ain't worth nothing. I bound you couldn't sell that junk for 30 cents. I tell you, why don't you just get a hold of Cedric or some youngin' and sell them the stock for, say, 10 cents a share, and they could use it for money to play store with. Would that be honest? Yeah, I don't know why it wouldn't be. Well, I do, because I'll do it then. <laughs> you sort of scared me with all that talk about not getting the in here after all. I, I don't know what I would do, Lum, if I missed out on that. Well, I don't either, to be honest. Go to the poorhouse, I reckon. Yeah, and the only trouble with that is we ain't got no poorhouse here. Well, why ain't we? Well, I don't know. Swamp Pine Ridge is awful behind time. After, it looks like every time somebody brings it up at a town council meeting, most all of us is voting again. It figured <laughs> we couldn't afford one, I reckon. Well, I dog is I ain't gonna vote again it if it ever comes up again. Hey, could I bring it up myself? Why, sure, you're a citizen. I am, huh? Yeah, I might could get out a petition and get a lot of folks to sign it. And then get a bill passed to raise enough money to build a nice, up-to-date, modern poorhouse here in Pine Ridge. Dog is I'm gonna do that. Yes, sir. Would be a good thing, no doubts about oh, it. Oh, we need it bad. Have all the modern improvements, running water and electricity and nice furniture and radios in every room. Hot dog. Billard tables and places for them all together of evening, play cards and checkers and flinch and dominoes and visit with one another and all such as that. Discuss the stock market. <laughs> Logis, now that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> just sort of spend all your time visiting with your friends, just taking life easy. <laughs> well, hey, sure. The county feeds you. No worries about where your next meal's coming from. No, no. Might even put in one of them golf courses like they got in there at the county seat. Give each fella a sack of golfing bats and let him get out there on the golfing field and enjoy himself. Oh, I would love to do that. You know, I stopped there along the fence and watched them play one day when I was at the county seat. I never did quite understand it. They stand there and face one direction and knock the ball the other, and then everybody go look for it. But I reckon they was having fun, they appeared to be. Well, it's sort of like growed up shinny, I think. Except you use a little round ball instead of a tin can. Uh-huh. I don't know how many strikes they get at it. It's more than you get in baseball, I know that. I saw a feller standing there swinging. I thought he's killing a snake at first. Yeah, well, I reckon just gives a feller more of a chance of hitting the ball, you know. <laughs> well, sir, I believe that'd be a good game for me to take up. 
I just never knowed before how nice it would be to live in a place like that. Oh, a feller'd have the time of his life. Why, sure. He'd never have to do another lick of work as long as he lived. You figure if a feller got out of partition and started raising money, why Pine Ridge could build a place like that, huh? Well, if you got the bill passed, well, then that raised the taxes to where the town had the money to build it. Yeah, get that bill passed. Now, now how, do, how do I go about doing that? Well, at the next council meeting, why, well, you'd take this petition along and show them how many folks have signed it, and that'll prove that everybody's for the idea, and then somebody will mo- make a motion about raising taxes for it, and then somebody else would second it, and then everybody says, A, hey, or if the majority of them says it, well, then it's all said. Uh-huh. Of course, now, that raise my taxes, too, though, wouldn't it? Not if you're in the poorhouse. Huh. If a body's in the poorhouse, he don't have to pay no taxes. He ain't got nothing to pay taxes on. Oh, <laughs> dog, is that right? Oh, well, sure. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. We wouldn't have to pay nothing. We? Yeah. You couldn't get in there, Lum. I'm the one that's going to be broke, not you. Oh, yeah, that's right, ain't it? Yeah, I'm broke. Well, what I could do is come over there and visit you most of the time. Over where? Well, wherever it's at, wherever they decide to build it. Oh, <laughs> that's right. There ain't been no place picked out for a jet, has it? Offhand, I ain't got no subjects for a good place, neither. Well, let's build it on this side of the hill, anyway. What hill? Well, any hill. They always say over the hill to the poorhouse. If a feller's poor enough to go to one, he oughtn't to have to climb a hill to get there long. Oh, that's right. It'd be better if he's downhill, would Yeah, the way my rheumatism has been cutting up lately, I don't want to climb no hill. Believe my giant water's dried up. I can't hardly get around. I oughtn't to have it too far from town, so in case we do decide to come into town low for a while, I wouldn't have to walk too far. Yeah, Mike could put it down there along the river summer. Then if we got tired of playing checkers and golfing and pitching horseshoes, such as that, why, it'd be handy to go fishing. Yeah, now that fishing sounds... Sounds good to me. That's a good point there, yeah. I'd say down along the river there'd be the place for it. Yeah, yes, sir. Might put it right down there along Big Eddy. There's as fine a hole of water for fishing as it is in this whole part of the country. Oh, they's fishing there, all right. Cedric and Gomer Bates keeps the trot line set across there the biggest part of the time. Hmm. They catched a channel cat the other night, weighed better than 12 pounds. Well, <laughs> Yeah, a feller can go down there in the shank of the evening most any day when the science is right and catch a right smart chance of sun pierce. Oh, yeah, yeah, a feller has to hide behind a tree to bait his hook. The more I think about it, the more I believe Big Eddie's a place to go. Yeah, of course, only trouble there is that's a right smart piece from town. Be an awful long walk. Yeah, it is a pretty good poke down there, all right. Of course, I reckon we could have a bus there on the place to haul us wherever we want to go. Bus? Yeah, I think most of them places general has one. That's a good idea. Maybe I could do the driving. I believe I'd like that. <laughs> Might get kind of tiresome just playing checkers and fishing all day long. Now, who owns that land along there around Big Eddy? Oh. Uh-huh. It'd be something we'd have to look into. That land would have to be bought up first. Yeah, yeah. Well, I ain't for sure now. I believe most of that ground on this side of the river belongs to Uncle Henry Lunsford. Well, we'd want it to be on this side of the river, all right, so if the river was up or something, we wouldn't have no trouble getting to town. I'm glad you thought of that. <laughs> that little stretch of ground just on the other side of that hill there at the mouth of Shack Creek would be a nice spot. Yes, sir, that'd be the very spot right there at the mouth of Shack Creek. Yeah, we could get Grandpap and Charlie Redfield and some of the fellas we like to move out there, too. Yeah. Mose Moods won't be sure and get him. <laughs> He's such a clown. Oh. Full of buffoonery. Yeah. He'd keep us roaring all the time. You know, I believe I better call Uncle Henry right now and see if he'll sell that ground. Yeah, I better call him. Yes, sir, I'll call him. Of course, if he won't sell, we'll have to start looking for a piece of ground somewhere else. Well, I don't want no other ground. That's it right there. That's the place Hi, first. Buddy. Uh-huh. Hey, I want to get some of that pe- peanut butter I got coming to me. Get some of that what? Can't you talk plain? Peanut butter. Oh, yeah. Well, go right ahead and help yourself, Cedric. The chunk style's on the upper shelf, I believe. I don't believe there's nobody at home over at Uncle Henry's place. You fellas ain't got no more deals you want to make with me, have you? I'll come out pretty good on that last one. Well, keep ringing them, Amy. Uncle Henry might just be sleeping. Henry, Cedric, I believe we have got another deal for you. How'd you like to buy some oil stock? Mom? Hello? Hello? You can get this stock for ten cents a share. Hello? Just a minute, I'll get it for you. It's in the cash drawer, ain't it, Abner? What'd you say, Long? Oh, nothing. I found it here. Well, ring him one more time, Amy. Now, he's bound to be around there somewhere. Yeah, here you are, Cedric. It'll make good play money. Or to have a lot of fun with this. Boy, that's pretty stuff, all right. Can I actually buy something with it? No, you can't buy nothing with stock. Especially not this stock. But you can play store with it. 
Tell you what, you can have the whole batch of it for 50 cents. How's that? Well, gosh, yes. That sounds even better than that other deal you made. Well, all right, Mamie. Much obliged for trying anyway. Uh, Goodbye. Here's my 50 cents, Mr. Lum, and I'm sure thankful to you. That's all right, Cedric. Don't forget your peanut butter. Hey, wait a minute. What's he got there, Lum? Well, that's that oil stock of yours. (laughs) He's taking the whole batch of it. Well, here, Cedric, you give me that stuff back. Well? Give me that. Why, Abner, you crazy idiot. I just did you a big favorance. Big favor? Why, sure. If you keep that stock, you'll lose that $100,000 in here. Well, that's what I want to do. Huh? Since we've been talking about that place down there by Big Eddie, I don't want that inherit money. I want to live in a poor house. Well, just how do you get in that poor house? I might be interested in that myself. Yeah, Abner apparently was a uh, customer of a seed company. And the person who owned the seed company chose Abner to leave his inheritance to on the terms that by the date that the uh, uh, will was to be read and executed, he had to be totally flat broke with no money at all. And so that's the deal. They're trying to get shed of all of Abner's possessions so that he can get this $100,000. Of course, like anything else that deals with Lum and Abner, you know it's not going to be that easy. And by the way, uh, we, I know we're in the tail end of summer, but don't forget that the uh, uh, Love and Abner Museum and the Jotham Down Store are open in Pine Ridge, Arkansas, and you can find all their information online. Uh, look up uh, uh, Google Love and Abner Pine Ridge, Arkansas, and you will find information about uh, both. They are open for tours and just browsing. Interesting stuff to see. That's uh, the Lum and Abner Museum and the Jot 'em Down Store in Pine Ridge, Arkansas. They really do exist. And what really exists is uh, this radio program. And we thank you for listening and hope you'll thank this station and support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. If you miss a day, you do not have to miss a single show at all. You can find all of that information by going to my webpage, which is at classicradio.stream. That is classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows on demand. You can learn more about classic radio collecting. You can uh, contact me there. You can find our social media links. You can find information on the various applications and sites that have our shows available for download. You can contact me. And by the way, you can also buy me a copy. That buy me a copy money goes to purchasing us new collections of the best radio shows of all time. Uh, Shows that we don't have in our collection or significantly better quality versions of those shows. Thanks for being with us. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.